Welcome, 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 welcome everyone to a transgenerational experience. This is our program for Black History Month. Tonight, your host will be Dr. James Dula. A transgenerational experience. And he will be moderating us and, and getting us ready for our speakers. We have a few guest speakers, but tonight I would like to tell you why we're doing this. We would like to explore the social cultural experiences and how they have affected who we have become. So introducing Dr. J. A. Dula. He is a retired and highly decorated military officer who has served as a U.S. Air Force commander for many years around the world. Today, he is a social cultural anthropologist, inspiring others to view reality, ponder the facts and arrive at the truth. He believes we as people and or society flourish based on truth versus speculation. Introducing Dr. James Dula. Well, good evening and thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Tara Lewis. And let me say, first of all, it is my pleasure to be here with uh, you and so many others tonight. And I, I just can't thank the spirit I have seen from those of you that are making a difference in our community and brought, making this broadcast possible. Tara Lewis, Crystal Glenn, Montre uh, Dupree, uh, you guys are just fantastic. And uh, from an evolutionary elder to you, I want to say this is what our generations are all about. The elders passing the torch to the new generation that is uh, growing and will assume our place in, in, uh, in the future. And uh, you're just doing a great job, and I just wanted to pass that out. Today, I often ask myself, when did we... Uh, transcend from being uh, a society where uh, we were family to becoming a society where what have you done for me lately? And it's, that's, that's what's important as we continue to look to the future and to uh, prepare our children to take our place. It was Dr. W.B. Du Bois who said, we like the path for future generations. But in order for them to be able to uh, uh, assume their rightful place on the throne, per se, uh, we as elders must stand tall. And we must teach our youth to stand tall. Because when we don't, then we are losing a big part of who we are. Later on, toward the end of the program, I will talk about history. I will talk about uh, our, our preparing our next generation for leadership. I will look at back to the future as we continue to look forward and prepare them so that they are ready to address any challenges that comes their way. People in my age group, we've already had our challenges. We, ch we had our challenges through Jim Crow. I was born under Jim Crow. We had our challenges during the civil rights movement. And we're facing new challenges today. That's why transgenerational education is so important. Because if we don't teach it now, how are our kids going to get it for the future? So that's why we're here tonight. And I look forward to having a great discussion as we have some super people who are going to present to uh, to you and, uh, and uh, share their ideas on who we are, where we're going, and more importantly, how do we get there? You know, I often say to my students, I said, arriving is important, but once you've arrived, what are you going to do with it? Frederick Douglass said, continue to agitate. The struggle is not dead. So in America, we must continue to struggle. But how are we going to do that? So here we are. I want to thank uh, Mr. Ms. Tara Lewis, once again, for allowing me to open up the program. And uh, as we march forward, keep in mind that we prepare the next generation for the challenges they will face today and beyond until tomorrow. So thank you, Ms. Lewis. And uh, 
I'll turn it back over to you and the next uh, the next uh, speaker. But just remember what I said. When did we evolve from a people where we are family and arrive at a place where what have you done for me lately? And we'll talk about that a little later. Thank you. interviewing our next uh, our first speaker which is Ms. Sharon Parker of Rosa Inks. Ms. Sharon Parker works for the federal government at Housing and Urban Development for over 35 years. She serves as a housing project manager. She loves working with the next generation and empowering youth to tap into leadership skills such as potential project management. Sharon is very passionate about inspiring and connecting boys and girls with established professionals in an array of business industries. Sharon is also a community servant and serves as president for the Maryland's Association of African, I'm sorry, the Maryland's Association of American Mothers, Inc. since 2016. She was recognized in 2013 as Maryland's AMI Mother of Achievement for numerous rise community youth activities she's hosted sharon also serves as president for the remembering our ancestors synergistic association which is rosa this organization empowers individuals to follow in the footsteps of positive individuals sharon was a former president for the hud robert c weaver blacks in government welcoming miss sharon parker Good evening, good evening. So um, I just wanna start off by saying, thank you, Dr. Dula for the invite. Um, you know, we go back <laughs> a little bit at Crossland High School. And um, I tell you, I, I'm a true believer that whatever titles I may have or may have had, there was always someone before me to help me get me in the door. And Sandra Kraft was just one of those people. And I met you through Sandra Kraft. So I just want to say that I, I applaud your introduction. I am 100% on board with what you're saying. And I hope Rosa can be one of those, um, continue to be one of those organizations that's ex doing exactly what you speak about, which is making a pathway for the next generation and doing it unconditionally. So um, yeah, y'all feel free to ask me any questions. I'm here. If you want me to go raw, I can do it. <laughs> So um, Tara, I'll just, I'll just start from the beginning. Um, you know, again, I want to applaud you and Chris as well, because we met here in Maryland um, under some platforms um, with Sir Charles Carey and other platforms that we met on. And I, again, I agree with Dr. Dula, you are doing a fabulous job and passing the torch to the next generation is something that all must continue to do. But guys, let me just give you a little history about what I've been doing in the community um, over, I would say the last 14 years. For those who don't um, know me, I started, um, me and my board members started Rosa back in 2007. We became official and we launched in 2008. Yes, the same year, um, Dr. Um, well, President Barack became president and his wonderful wife, Michelle Obama, was first lady and, and they motivated me. They motivated me to do everything Everything in my power to follow in leadership. In order for me to do that, I had to go out there and learn a little bit about my own history first. And I had to learn about, you know, where did I come from? What, what do I have in me? What are these, you know, gifts that I have in me? And, 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 and am I creating these same gifts for the next generation? So over the last, I would say, 14 years, we've been really, really collaborating, what I would like to say, building positive synergy in the community, connecting people together, connecting our youth together, connecting our elders, elders together. There hasn't been one event that I have that I've had that I have not had all generations in the in the room. You know, four different generations, sometimes five different generations in the room, working together, collaborating, and sharing their story. So um for um, as Tara said, I, I work in the federal government and I love project management because project management helps keeps me focused, helps keeps me, you know, in alignment with what it takes to develop a team, 
you know, lead a team, and most importantly, know that the end users are the one who's going to benefit from it. So I've been working with the National Congress of Black Women, the National Urban League, um, the Cadoza Educational Campus. We've been able to bring people into those um, places under a program that we call RISE. And RISE means Rosa Youth Empowerment Series. And we started that back in 2016. And we haven't stopped. We're going to be working with the DC Marionberry Summer Youth Program. This will be our sixth year working with them. And um, that's what I do. I, I do exactly what Dr. Dula was talking about, passing that torch, making it not about, you know, what has someone done for me lately, but, you know, what can I do for others to help them along the way? Because I remember when I was five years old in, in my hometown in an urban, you know, very rural, not urban, but a very rural um, community called Calvert County, Maryland, only 45 minutes from Washington, D.C. But it was like, you know, hundreds of miles away because my mom did not have a car. So unfortunately, we were I consider myself stuck in the country. But at five years old, um, I talk about me being a civil rights baby in my book. True synergy work, leading within the seven defining principles of knowing yourself to birth greatness. I, I share in that book about me being a civil rights baby. And at five years old, when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated, you know, I shared before that I, I, I went on the church ground and I was already playing at the time. But I asked God, God, why is it that people of color are not liked by others? You know, expecting an answer, didn't get one, went back to plan. Four, four, four decades later, you know, I get birthed into Rosa and and my and and I started learning about my history, about African American history, about other cultures' history, and I started just sharing with everyone that would listen. Well, as I was learning about history, I got the answer, and that was, you know, sometimes people are intimidated, they're scared, and they really want to control people who are great. And 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 all that I was studying, I was reading nothing but great things, great inventors, great scholars, great, you know, entertainers, great mathematicians, you know, scientists. I was reading all of this great stuff about Black people. And that was my answer. The reason why I believe sometimes Blacks are being mistreated because a lot of people know what resides in us. And they benefit from that 24-7, financially, you know, um, physically, you know, socially, all, all you can possibly think of. So my job was easy. It was quite, It was to how would I inspire the next generation to follow in the footsteps of our elders first and then look at established professionals out there doing what they're doing in the community and hopefully connecting them with established professionals who are serving the community and most importantly, causing them to want to share their voice, to want to, you know, lead under whatever they, their passion, their dream and their initiative was. And that's what I've done over the years. Just, you know, be a, a vehicle for building synergy, you know, I could go on and on and on and on, but I, I just thank God just for keeping me focused. I thank him for allowing me to tell my civil rights story. And I'm, and I'm so glad to be here on the last day, of course, of uh, Black History Month. But, you know, my mindset is Black History is, is 365 every year. So I've been doing it for 14 years now, over 4,000 days, um, you know, doing promoting. So when people say that, you know, we need more organization, we need more people doing, you know, what, what they're not teaching our children in school. Well, sometimes we just have to go out there and Google someone like Rosa, remembering our ancestors, Synergistic Association, and just see what we're doing. Um, and we're just doing a lot and, and we're not doing it alone. We're doing it with so many different people. And I'm just so honored to be here to share my story. Thank you, Ms. Thank Sharon. You. We appreciate it. We appreciate you giving us uh, the background on Rosa and um, what you do and why you do it. Next up, we have our second speaker. And we'll be having Miss Montre Dupree introduce this young man. Uh, training the next generation, bridging the gap. And James is definitely our next generation of leaders within that next generation of leaders. And he will definitely be making an impact in our community. James Collier is the 12 year old founder and CEO of Three For Me. 
Uh, Bullying Free For Me, Inc. is an anti-bullying movement that provides resources to children, educators, parents, and communities to help children overcome bullying. He and his mother uh, implemented the program when James became when James became a victim of bullying, and even started acting out uh, himself and withdrawing. So together they created a wonderful pro- this wonderful program, Three for Me Bullying, anti bullying program, and it is my pleasure to introduce James. He is such a phenomenal and talented young man, and I can't wait for you to meet him. So James Collier. Hello, everyone. As said before, my name is James Collier, and I'm the Chief Visionary Officer of Three for Me, Inc., the anti-bullying movement, which is, well, my anti-bullying company that helps helps kids overcome bullying with uh, three things, love, plan, and create. Love, plan, create, which is love yourself, say affirmations, and there is also, after love yourself, there is cre- plan plan how to end bullying, or maybe if someone's bullying you, then make a plan with a parent. This is for the kids. Make a plan with the parent so that, make a plan with the parent so you can find a way to end the bullying so that you won't, you don't just have to go up and say, oh, you're whatever, and with like bully him or something like that. And then there's create, like use your uh, negative feelings because you've been bullied. Use your negative feelings to use your negative feelings. Okay, you can use your negative feelings to create whatever you like to do. Maybe if it's drawing, if it's if it's anything, drawing, art, maybe listen to music, make music, coding, whatever. And it all started back in 2018 when I was being bullied. And back then I was in aftercare and no one would play with me. There was this one kid who would, uh, one time he started choking me. That's physical bullying, which is just all physical stuff, but, uh, kicking, punching, pushing. And then he, uh, called me, he called me names like idiot and stuff. And then after that, uh, there's also social bullying. He told everyone to uh, not play with me. And then I drew this little four-page comic book. And once I drew it, I gave it home to my... I uh, came home to talk to mom. And she uh, told me, hey, you want to publish this? And I was like, yeah, because it was a new experience. And I hadn't uh, published a book before. So I did that and I was really excited because now, well, I'm really excited because I, uh, my third and fourth book dropped. Uh, I'm waiting for it to print, but my first and second book, I have a, it's a force uh, series comic book. So my first and second book are here uh, and my third and fourth book are coming out soon. And uh, Black History is really a great experience. Like I, me, I want to uh, grow up and be uh, a Black pilot and then be uh, in the Air Force. I wanna be in one of those F-15s flying all the way off around my house, making all that noise while I'm trying to get my schoolwork done. So, that's uh, that's what I want to do. Uh, I want to be a part of Black History. Uh, I want to just be a part of everything, pretty much. I also want to be an astronaut when I grow up. And I've actually met a uh, actually met an Air Force pilot. Uh, his name was Charles McGee. He was one of the original. Oh, he was one of the original Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, he has uh, recently died. I'm very sad that that happened, but I will t- tell you about my experience with him. So my experience, it all started out in uh, in a museum when I got a book and I got it signed. So oh, he is a brigadier, uh, Charles McGee, Brigadier Charles McGee. And then I sat, he uh, had a microphone. He's, we, he, we sat down and listened to his story. And it was pretty interesting since uh, he had been 
uh, bullied in uh, earlier years, segregation. Uh, back then, actually, here's a fun fact. Uh, black people have been in every U.S. conflict for the last 200 years. But, uh, but the white people at the time didn't think that they were still good enough for war. Uh, so they didn't think that they were efficient. So they had separate barracks, separate medical, uh, separate, uh, separate army hospitals, separate everything. Uh, they didn't have the right, they didn't have enough munitions. All the munitions uh, went to the white soldiers and they were normally used for labor jobs, uh, like maybe unloading and loading supplies and a bunch of other stuff. So after that, uh, he told me all about that and I also that later that day I actually met another pilot who uh flew the jets. He had also been segregated, a victim of segregation. And he gave me these little model model planes with some paints. And I literally sat down, got a bunch of newspaper, sat down and uh and painted and did those little model planes. I was really excited because this is my first uh, my first time ever experiencing those things from a black pilot. So I'm very uh, I'm very happy to be a part of the black community. Thank you so much, James. Um, you are no so problem. phenomenal. I remember the first time I met you and uh, not only, James also encourages entrepreneurship uh, of other youth. Uh, he has a, a group of youth uh, also that are young entrepreneurs and he's just making a dynamic impact in the community. Again, our, the next generation uh, will definitely have some great leaders. Uh, we're looking at leaders like James. So thank you again for joining us tonight. No problem. Absolutely. So I'd like to, before we move on to the next part of the program, I'd like to share with you all some uh, quotes by Dr. Uh, Dula. The first quote, uh, regarding peaceful coexistence, we may not travel the same path nor march in stride, but with determination and will, we will get there together. All education does not take place in the classroom. However, without education, regardless of where or how it is obtained, one is doomed to ignorance. Thank you so much, Dr. Dula, for these great quotes. Uh, they are definitely impactful to each of us, so thank you. Our next guest speaker is Samay Rashad, and he is a dynamic project manager and engineer who brings his love for solving problems to organizations and big and small to impact the family unit, the community and nation. Samay was born in Oakland, California, and was raised in Prince George's County, Maryland. He attended Bowie State University where he studied mathematics and Morgan State University where he studied industrial and systems engineering. And he graduated magna cum laude. In his day job, he advises clients on strategy and technology. In addition, Samay has also used his creative voice to write for a family and parenting blog, Living As We Are. The on success blog for the Washington Post and co-hosted the Men Towards Fathers podcast and Tiny Till Learns to Color, A Little Crayon Search for Purpose, which is his debut children's book. Samay is also a family man. and He has been married for 10 years and has two sons and a daughter. Welcoming Samay Rashad. Hey, hey, good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. 
Awesome. Well, glad to be here tonight. Um, good evening to everybody. Um, got baby girl with me, with me here, so hopefully she stays asleep. Uh, but this is a great. Uh, it's great to great to be here with everybody. Um, and I'm guessing uh, I should talk a little bit about what Black History Month means to me, right? All right. So Black History Month for me, I mean, it's a loaded. That is a loaded question. Um, I'll start with. Um, I'll start with um, some perspective, right? So I am actually uh, half. African American and Filipino, and like many others in this country, you know, I'm like a melting pot of different um, backgrounds. You know, you pull up the the ancestry.com, and there's, you know, my my chart is all over the place. I got some some Inuits, which is from Alaska. I got, you know, West Africa, and of course the Philippines and and America and Jamaica. And so uh, my family lineage is all over the place and identity is, I think, when I think about black history, um, my parents ingrained us, um, you know, their own personal perspectives. My dad's from New York City, Brooklyn. Uh, my mom is from uh, Oakland, California, uh, the Bay Area. And so history, black history, you think about culture, which is like music, the food we eat. Um, it's the knowledge and education and passing it on like Dr. Dula has done so over the years. I mean, I fell in love with W.B. Du Bois and all the different debates of our, um, you know, from a scholarly perspective um, in, my, in my college years, interning with the Prince George's Chamber of Commerce. And fast forward, now that I have children, three in fact, um, I, I wanted to have conversations about diversity with my children and not run into the same challenges I, I had as a, as a youth. You know, my mom and dad, while they taught us a lot about history, they didn't talk us about their unique perspectives per se, um, that you you might be of the generation where, you know, some things they just weren't spoken about. And so for me, um, I struggled with understanding where I came from. And and so I wrote a book, um, Tiny Teal Learns the Color. It's about a little teal crayon whose mom is blue, his dad is green. He's something in between. And he's trying to figure out his purpose, like many of us. And I think that that's universal. Uh, and so when we when you think about history, and as African Americans, as people of African heritage, being um, robbed of our heritage, where do we come from? It's 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 something we still deal with today. And I don't want to be caught off guard. I don't think many parents want to be caught off guard when their children ask them, you know, we got all these all this stuff now. You can pull up ancestry and DNA, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, um, you know, this country, I'm, I'm, I'm Nigeria, or tell me a little bit about um, you know, how we got here. I you want to be able to have a conversation with your children because their minds are just a blank slate. And so um for me. For me, um, Tiny Teal, um, Color the World and Color It Well is a life of a crown from Colorsville. It's the opening quote. Um, everybody's searching for a purpose. Everybody, but, but in order to have a purpose, I think my perspective, we have to know where we come from. We have to know what's in us. You know, my grandfather, both of my grandfathers, my mother and my wife are all artists. My sons are artists. I mean, we're all artists. You know, that's what. Picasso says. Um, so we have to do a better job of helping our kids understand where they come from in order so they can have a purpose, so they can know what their purpose is and feel confident in it. And so Black history for me is um, is is also discovery. I'll leave you with that. Um, if there's more time, I can go more into it. But, you know, you got past, present, future history. Black history bridge is the bridge between. Thank you. Thank you, Samay. 
We appreciate you coming on and telling us a little bit about what you have going on. And we look forward to you joining the discussion, which will be coming up soon. But right now we have two more quotes um, that will be said by Montre Dupree. And they're, of course, by the Socratic speaker. Absolutely. My country, tis of thee, without my liberty, a place of love without love we forever see. On vision, critical thinking is a choice we as a people must embrace to replace doubt with hope and fear with faith. And that concludes your quotes. Thanks, Montre. Absolutely. Um, so what we want to do right now, we want to bring up uh, Dr. Dula, the Socratic speaker. He's also known as the, the Socratic speaker and the founder of the Ducratic Agenda. And we want to bring up the rest of our speakers and we want to get into a conversation about the transgenerational um, experience. And this is the whole purpose of this program is to connect past and present. So we can light the path for future generations and and what a little bit of what everybody said today, Miss Sharon, um, uh, James, Samay, everybody kind of had a piece of that. So I want to open the floor for you guys to have a conversation about this. Dr. Dula, of course, we want you to lead that conversation. You always have a great knowledge and wisdom for us. So I'm just going to hand it over to you, Dr. D. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Lewis. I appreciate that. And uh, I want to say to our speakers, your points were well taken because you see uh, where we have been and where we need to go. And Black History Month is an opportunity for us to come together in a spirit of unity so that we can share with one another our experiences as we look back and as we look forward. I, I, I often tell people uh, we must stay on our toes. We cannot be complacent because complacency is the, beginning, is the beginning of eradication, thus minimizing transitional education with the ability to act constructively in a unified manner. So we must always think forward. We must always make sure that we're working together. And to James, I would like to say this. I am a person that served in the United States Air Force for 30 years, and it wasn't always easy. When I went in, I had no idea what I wanted to do. But you know, I just kept, uh, I kept uh, working hard. I kept following uh, the principle that Dr. W.E.D. Boyd said, uh, when he said that uh, we must always look to the future. We must always work together. And, uh, and uh, because uh, divided, we will fall, uh, but together we will remain strong. So uh, I looked to my ancestors and I looked to my grandparents and my parents and said, uh, and I saw the faith that they had in me. And I took that as strength. I took it as strength because I knew that if they believed in me, then I could believe in myself. And the, and the future was going to be bright. That's why I met Miss uh, Sharon Parker. <laughs> I, I often tell people uh, I, I turned down a a, a six-figure salary to, to teach high school. <laughs> <laughs> and people told me you must be crazy. Uh, those kids don't want to learn anything. And and uh, I would look at them and say, with an attitude like that, they certainly wouldn't learn anything. So uh, Miss Park and I came together. We uh, we and we touched many lives. And uh, today I look back at young men like uh, Samir Rashad, who, when I was the president and CEO of the Prince George's Chamber of Commerce, he walked into the office and uh, more or less said uh, with two other young men and said, we want to be here to, to be mentored. And uh, I think he was a, probably a sophomore or junior at Bowie State University at that time. And, uh, and I took him under my wing and I'm so proud of him today because I, I followed his progress uh, as he went on to the engineering school at Morgan State University. And when he uh, was married, uh, I met his, his beautiful young wife and now they have three kids together. He still owes me a meal. I bought the first one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you know, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, when, when I think about the transgenerational experience, there were a lot of bad things that happened in our community. Mm -hmm. I mean, stop and think about it. We 
were taken from our motherland in shackles, brought across the middle mm -hmm. passage. And those of us that survived were known as to be the strongest of the strong. But yet it wasn't over. The journey was tough. We worked in cotton fields from sun up to sundown. We're beaten if we if we uh, had a descending opin opinion. We're killed if we decided to run away for freedom. Had to steal away to worship God. Mm -hmm. And what many don't realize, when our people were brought from Africa to here, they already had religions. How many of you have seen roots? When we look at roots, Kunta Kinte would not eat the pork. Why would he not eat the pork? He was a Muslim. And, 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 and it was hard to break his will. So, so we have endured a lot of, of, of cultural changes that were in Africa would have been commonplace, but here we had to learn new rules and regulations and how to, how to thrive. So the challenges were real. But thank God we had people like uh, Nat Turner. I like Nat Turner. You know, he had a vision, but uh, he was a rebellious soul. Thank God we had people like Harriet Chapman, and she is her 200th birthday is uh, next month. And I'm encouraging everybody to wear something red, green, and black on their lapel or on their wrist uh, to signify that uh, that she was a true warrior, a military warrior. Uh, she led uh, campaigns. Uh, she led people to freedom. And I think it's important that we as a people remember who we are by remembering those that came before us and paved the way. They lit the path for us, their future generation. So their posterity was our, uh, their prosperity was our posterity. We are that next generation. They prospered because they were a strong-willed people. They weren't always rich. It's, I'm not talking about prospering and money, uh, but they prospered because of the will of the mind. And they, and, they, and they were strong people. And they gave birth to us. And so it's up to us now to light the path for that next generation. Uh, Rashad spoke of Dr. W.B. Du Bois. If you haven't read The Souls of Black Folk, you need to get in there and take a look at it because he talks about the people. He talks about respecting ourselves, and he talks about uh, coming together to work for brighter uh, days ahead. Uh, he said uh, that, that we don't want to... Uh, wait another 400 years to get freedom and equality and justice. We had already endured 400 years of slavery. We want our freedom and equality and justice today. That's right. You know? And I take that and I put it together with Malcolm X, who said, uh, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. And I, I thought about that. And I thought about the 20th century and the 21st century. And I said, you know, that's a true statement. But now it's time to crawl from under that rock because we are an educated people. We are a smart people. Our only handicap is we have to get back to working in a spirit of unity so that we benefit one another. When I was growing up, and maybe some other callers on here, the, the, the elders always told us, if you don't do it for yourself, do it for your race. Do it for your race. I'll say that again. If you don't do it for yourself, do it for your race because they understood that if you look good, the race looked good. So we've got to get back to that mentality to where we see ourselves not as three-fifths of a person, not as a worthless person, not as someone that can't achieve and dream and, and reach new heights, but go back to that time when faith ruled who we were. Exactly. It was a big part of who we were. Dr. Duke, I don't I, and I, I do not like interrupting you You're fine. because you are just a historian within your own right. But I just wanted to point out something that I've noticed just about your um, platform and also your 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 um, your message for the day. So I believe you have four generations right now on the screen. Your generation, I'm a generation. Um, Rashad is a generation and his baby is a generation, right? So you are doing it. You have created this platform where now you, you're speaking the words that this generation needs to know about. But I also want to share another perspective also. And, I, and, and, and you mentioned about what you went through at your generation. In my generation, I'm a baby boomer. 
Okay. I'm not a traditional like my mom. I'm not a millennial. I'm not a, a Gen Z or, or, or a, 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 one of those X's, you know, I'm not, I'm just a baby boomer, but I came on the end of the baby boom. I'm like the year before it turned into a millennial, I am born. Right. So I didn't experience what your generation did. My generation had a little easier than your generation because my mom, they worked the fields, they worked the tobacco fields, the farm fields. I didn't have to do that, but they instilled in me that I had to get an education. Yes, things were rough. Yes, we were poor. We may have had 40 acres in Calvary County, Maryland, and we may have had land and houses or whatever, but we were still poor, but we worked hard to work the land. So only thing I had to do was go to school, get good grades, get a good job, and then figure out what I wanted to do in life. So I had a hard head, so it, it took me a little longer to get where I needed to go. But I did finally settle down in the government. So I'm sharing it to share that this next generation coming behind us now, or like my daughter, you know, she's following in my path. You know, she's gone to school, got her education, and now she's working. But I am a little concerned about my grandchildren. My grandchildren, I'm so extremely concerned about because the doors that either were closed or were or even were open are not readily open for them today. You know, sure. those, those things called fobs where you got to, you know, use to get into a building where those grandkids can't get into, into those buildings like we did in our generation to meet people, to learn about whatever they're doing behind the scenes that we weren't invited to. So I'm a little, con a lot concerned about them too, but I also want to share that there's some great stuff happening for African-Americans today, you know, for the last year. Unfortunately, George Floyd had to die in order for the world to revisit African-American history and culture. And I'm here to tell you every platform I can think of is talking African-American history right now. Okay, you turn on the television, they're talking African American history and culture. You turn on the radio, the podcast, the, the you know, the the the, the Zoom, just even some schools, they're talking it. So we have done our job and we're continuing to do it. Now I think it's about how do you like you said, we build that unity. I call it synergy, you call it unity. <laughs> how do we come together now and recognize what everyone is doing so that we can do it collectively for the benefit of the community? Yeah, I think, Sharon, um, as you said, the world is watching. We're all talking about it. Um, and it's so, using social media, using uh, virtual platforms to stay engaged and bridge, bridging the disconnect um, yeah. with intergenerational panels such as this one yes. um, and making it intentional so that there is impact. Uh, when my son was in school, we had uh, grandparents in the classroom who were volunteers. And that made such a difference uh, because the children, one, they were able to learn how to respect their elders, not just in the home, but also in the communities. Yes. And so continuing to be intentional about those interactions and how to stay connected, even though we're still socially distancing in some ways, exactly. but using uh, virtual platforms to meet the different age groups and, and again, bridge that generational uh, gap and make it a transgenerational experience. Absolutely. So I think programs like this format um, in our faith-based institutions, just be in intentional about the impact that we're trying to make. Um, so I think this is a great start for that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, this, you're right. This is a great start. It is the beginning of a a new movement because I often tell people the struggle is not dead. We are still in the middle of a uh, of a of a of a revolutionary change. Mm. Uh, two years ago, uh, we were wondering what's the next step because we saw a new old new old uh, mentality surface that uh, did not quite put us in the light that we wanted to be put in. Mm -hmm. Did not did not quite uh, look at us as we thought we should be looked at. Uh, we, my generation has been through that, uh, but how you're right. How do we prepare the next generation for what we're seeing in America today? Right. Uh, I mean, it, it's evident that uh, I may have grown up under Jim Crow, but Junior is right back in the fray. 
Yeah. And so uh, we've got to prepare them. And that's why it's important, uh, as uh, as uh, Ms. Parker said, that we get back to uh, working together, that we keep things like programs like this moving forward and that we keep, as James said, that we keep planning. When I was growing up, James, I would spend Saturday mornings in NAACP, uh, National Association of Advancement of Colored People meetings in, the, in one church. And then that afternoon, I was sitting in the Southern Christian Leadership Church, SCLC, uh, uh, SCLC uh, for another meeting. So between the two, we were able to plan our, our movement forward. Mm -hmm. Planning is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we have to come back together and start looking at how we move your generation forward so that you understand uh, the role you will play in present day society. Exactly. Hey, and, Dr. And oh, oh I was, I was, sorry, Sharon, do you want to go? No, go ahead, please. I, I was going to actually respond to your point and Doc, Doc's point. Um, because I feel like when I was when I was coming of age and, and we were I was an intern with the, the chamber, I was probably like freshman, sophomore, actually, when we started. Right. There was like I could look to uh, many of the things that you that that just worked. Like if I wear the right clothes, if I have the right mentality, if I have a business card, like there's going to be opportunities that just open. Right. Just simple things like that, setting myself apart professionally. But. To Sharon's point about some of the doors that have closed for, for the the, you know my my baby girl's generation, her brothers, um, there are also new opportunities, right? Like I'm starting to ask myself, my wife and I talk about this all the time. Like what, you know, do they like? I'm like, you know, we need to save for college, and she's like, do they even do they need to go to college, right? You can learn AWS for free, uh, Amazon Web Services. You can learn. To draw, you can you can you can become. Many of our youth want to be producers and or get into NFTs and things like that. You can learn all of that for free, or come up with a model where you start to learn for free and then you start to get paid. And you can easily not easily you got to put in work. But there's so many different avenues for youth to for people people in general. Even if you're restarting your career um, and you're you're a grandmother, you can. Um, you can create a digital business uh, at the click of a button. Back in the back in the, that time, when I was coming up, or even prior, you had to go to a market, and it was a one-to-one -one relationship. But now you can have a business across the globe and never leave your couch. So there's new opportunities, and I think we just have to think a little bit more. Like to James' point about planning and what you were saying, mm -hmm. Doc, we have to we have to kind of upend those old ways of thinking or ways that work in a in a non-digital environment because i i published a book because the publishing companies like they just didn't get back to me they didn't respond to my email and everybody's everybody's um i self-published everybody's like way of doing it was their own like they had their own form you got to email this person don't email us for three months there's all these like rules but uh, I have a friend who works at Amazon. He was like, you can be published tomorrow. You can mm -hmm. sell your book tomorrow on Amazon. I was like, why am I? I wasted a year, Doc. I wasted a year trying to, trying to traditionally publish. So this book that I wrote was written like, it was written in like 2019. I, I published it last year. I wasted a year trying to work with an agent and publishing house. So, sorry. Um, and um, Wow Radio, a comment on Wow Radio. I remember when they got in the game early on the uh, the podcast, right? Um, before everybody started to do it. So we also have to look out when those new opportunities come out and get teach our teach people how to how to take those tools and use them, um, so we can create more opportunities. Absolutely. And then you know to add to what you're saying, when you talked about your book. A lot of people are here today, and, I, and I'm gonna have to keep it real. I tell people there's always two sides to every story, right? You got those who want to help you, and you got those, and I'm talking about even your own kind sometimes, okay? And you have those who want to help you, but take from you while they're helping you. So how do you distinguish those two? And um, sometimes we are our own worst enemy because we let money drive us. And when money drives us, we miss out on so many great connections and so many um, 
great opportunities. I know a lot of people here. I get it that you're a professional. I get it that you're a speaker, you're an author, you're a coach, you're a mentor, but you have a job. OK, and you may be in the corporate business where it's not right to take for someone who don't have a job just to get just to pretend that they're on your level because they are an author or a coach. And a lot of that has been going on for, I would say, I've recognized it for the last five years. There's been there used to be predatory housing going on out there. Now it's predatory entrepreneurship, if you will, <laughs> if you will. And, and, I'm, and I'm asking, and I'm, I'm sharing this because I'm asking the public just to be considerate of what people, especially the disadvantaged people are going through. They don't have funds. Even if they're willing to spend money they don't have, it's not fair to take it. So the fact that you went on Amazon and got your book um, published, kudos to you because you didn't wait for that published company to get back to you or someone acting like a publishing company to get back to you. But I do want to ask um, James a question. James, um, it was mentioned earlier that how can we kind of bridge the gap between the next generation? Um, you said you wrote four books, if and I, and I thought I heard you say four books, but have you, is yeah. your mom and your grandmom, you know, are they, are they, you know, in support of you? And are they learning from what you're doing or are you all learning collectively? Uh, we're all, uh, we're all learning with me. Uh, my grandmother is recently deceased back February, 2021, I think. So sorry. But, uh, oh, it's fine. Uh, then, I mean, me and my mom were helping, uh, we set up a canvas account, we, a canvas account. We did, we do everything together. She helps me, uh, with getting events and driving me to events she's basically my momager if you could say it that way you could say that awesome. say it that way. I love it. james can i can i interject please james could you tell them about your the comic book and um your artwork and how you uh retain rights to the artwork for your comic book please ah so the artwork well really the artwork on the uh book is not my artwork i'm uh I'm terrible at drawing. Uh, it is by someone uh, from uh, Egypt. We did, so I sent over the books and stuff. And then uh, I sent over like the script. I would get, I have the tiny notebook. We would put all the script in there, send it to him with like page four, box four, put it, uh, put it into a little book and, uh, put into a little just a text, send it to him, and he makes wonders. So uh, out of all the four books, I'm thinking that the fourth is my favorite because it's just, I'm not gonna do spoilers though because you might wanna read it. Well, I wanna purchase it. <laughs> so put your website uh, in the chat or something. I want that book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as we continue to move forward, uh, let's just, change the subject just a little bit. I can remember that uh, when I was coming up, uh, we had sayings that my grandparents and and my nurturing community, because I, I actually grew up in a village community surrounded by uh, relatives uh, who had to come home from World War II and, mm. and uh, those that uh, were working hard in the garden to put food on the table and, and uh, things of that nature. But one of the sayings I always use still today is that honesty is the best policy. And uh, as we as we enter this new era, and I'm listening to uh, some of the comments, maybe we have to focus on uh, on what what is honesty in today's uh, in today's world. And uh, I was in a conversation uh, a, a few times over the last couple of months that talked about uh, voting. And it said, you know, the reason that we oftentimes find ourselves in, in places we don't want to be as a society is because we vote for charisma. We vote for smiles. We vote for, for dress. And we forget that the most important factor is to vote based on knowledge. Yes, yes. My father used to say, vote your knowledge. When he would pick up the seniors 
in the station wagon. For those of you that don't know what a station wagon was, it was a precursor to the SUV. <laughs> and uh, he would he would drive around the community and pick up the seniors uh, at that time and drive them to the polls. That's what you call community unity. Yes. Uh, the senior, the, 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 those young men that had come back from World War II, like my dad, who had uh, fought uh, in the in the Navy in uh, the in the Pacific, going from island to island, re resupplying the troops on the ground uh, with bullet uh, we call it bullets and beans. Uh, he never talked about that. He was such a a, a a humble person. He would never talk about what he did. But when after he passed, I found his diary, mm. and then I learned. You know the sacrifice he had made, and uh, and uh, why I was the way that I was, uh, because he always said, you know, walk like a man, always be honest, uh, integrity is important, yes, uh, do the right things, and maybe we need to get back to some of those old saying, uh, doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Mm -hmm. uh, there's many lessons that we need to teach our younger generation that uh, we take for granted that they know, but we've never told them. Right. We've never told them. Uh, and I've often heard people say, you may not think they're listening when you speak to them, but when they need it, they can recall it. Exactly. Yes. As a teacher, I used to have people bringing their sons into my office. And they would say, Dr. Doolin, would you talk to my son? Because I don't know what to do anymore. And I would often tell the parent that when you stop talking, you start losing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I would tell them the story about my daughter when I would take her to McDonald's because every time I would ask her, how's your day? It was always fine. Mm -hmm. How's everything going? Fine. <laughs> well... <laughs> You know, fine got to be old. That wasn't fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I would take my daughter to McDonald's. And if she's on tonight, she, she, she knows this is true. I would take her to McDonald's and we would sit with a Big Mac or whatever, a cheeseburger. And I learned more than I wanted to learn because you took them to, to a place of comfort. Yes. To where they felt comfortable to express themselves. And I would tell them, take your son or your daughter out to a park buy a hamburger and so maybe you're going to need this later on and uh and uh and uh, just let nature take its course and i never had a parent to come back to me never and say it didn't work so we need to get back to our roots we don't eat at the dinner table anymore so we can't have a conversation around eating a meal but we can certainly find places where we can we can go to say things like Honesty is the best policy. Right. Keep the faith. Keep hope alive. You are somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, integrity matters. Uh, like Samae said, my segregated school, when we when we showed up at that segregated school, the principal is at the door to make sure that we were dressed appropriately, to make sure that we, uh, our shoes, even though they were tennis shoes, we might have walked through mud to get there. You'd already gone to the bathroom to clean them up because you know the principal was going to give you a shakedown mm -hmm. because they were teaching us standards they were yes. teaching us values yes they were teaching us how to mm -hmm. act as mm -hmm. in a civilized world where people were judging you by how you look right and today i still shine my shoes miss parker you might know know this i went to cross on every day with a yes. shiny yes. pair of shoes my pants were creased a nice cream right. sugar. Absolutely. Child, and uh the kid, you know, the kids would look at me and they they would say, huh, he dresses nice every day. Right. But I knew that it worked when prom time came or something yeah. happened at the school and that young man came into my room and he said, Mr. Doula, how you like these shoes? <laughs> how you like this tie? See, right. as I said before, you may not think they're listening. You may not think they're looking, but they mm. see everything you do. And if it's the honorable thing, 
they will imitate it. Yes. Because their mind says they want to be like you. So Dr. Dula, let me ask, um, and, I, and all of the things you just shared are definitely character building skills that even us adults needs to continuously remember even when, like you said, people are not watching, okay? We need to remember how we're acting behind the scenes. You know, we need to remember how we're acting in front of our children, you know, when no one's watching, and even especially when you're out in the public. Are there some general um, uh, transgenerational tools that can be used to help us, you know, um, engage one another, collaborate better like this platform for example is definitely i would consider a tool young people are so smart now they're born into technology so at one two three years old they're clicking on this and they're clicking on that so how can we you know um use these platforms to build a way of you know just connecting with the next generation and i'll just share one that i can't, i just stumbled across don't laugh at me y'all but i stumbled across one okay and that was i wrote my book back in 2017 five years ago and i asked my children and my grandkids read my book read my book read my book and my daughter read my book and my grandkids like i'm gonna read it, i'm gonna read it and then i started working with the marionberry summer youth program and i brought my granddaughter on i said i'm gonna pay you because dc can't pay you because you live in maryland but i'm gonna pay you to be a part of this program a junior project management program and i want you to learn how to do flyers i want you to learn how to speak to professionals i want you to do all this but then it hit me what and she was doing everything i asked her do, to do and she was doing it really really good so I said to her, I said, you know what? I want you to read my book and I want you to put it in a voiceover format. That little girl, that little granddaughter of mine was like, but grandma, how much you gonna pay me? <laughs> I said, I'll pay you, but I'm not gonna pay you until it gets done. So of course, you know, three you know, weeks go by and she wants an advance and it didn't do the work, right? And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna pay you until you get this done. So she finally sent me about three chapters of my book where she read it in a voiceover, but she used that technology. I still don't know how she did it, but she used that technology and she sent me a text and said, here it is. Can I get paid now? <laughs> <laughs> but she learned uh, that was an aspect of her learning, you know, a, a little bit about her own family story, even though she wanted to get paid for it. So that's just one example. Can you provide some others? Mm. You know, uh, one of the things that I have begun doing is uh, getting out into the community and visiting with people that I know to be, uh, let's say, transgenerationalists. Mm. And, and that's that's a tough word for a country boy from North Carolina to say. Mm. That's a tough person. People like Miss Arrington, who is at St. Stephen's Baptist Church, I think it is, who are taking in children and working with them to help them restructure their lives so they can see the worth in being ambitious, the worth in dreaming, the worth in working hard to achieve certain goals. Uh, and there are other examples that I have run, run in through different ministries mm -hmm. who are beginning to do the same thing, to take a look at the next generation of young leaders yes. who need that extra guidance and finding out the right button to push to help that child uh, see that they are somebody and yeah. they are worth something. And uh, I think that, you know, my generation, and I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it, so don't shoot me. Uh, we believed in, in, in pulling up our pants and walking with dignity. Mm. When, when did we start having the audacity to think that it was okay to walk around and show your undergarments. Mm. My generation says, what happened? You know, where, where did we go wrong? See, we don't say where the kids go wrong because we teach them better, they act better. But we say to ourselves, where did we go wrong? And we're trying to figure all that out now. Mm. You know, I won't see that change that's needed to get back to where we were in my lifetime because we're talking about a, a multi-generational uh, uh, mind conditioning thing. Yes. But if it uh, doesn't start true. now with us here today, and if we don't keep this group and the people on this line 
uh, coming together to share ideas and share our concerns and and uh, talk about how we can overcome some things. Yes. So it's going to be very difficult to climb to that mountaintop of where we want to be. Exactly. But the only way we're going to be able to do it is, what is that saying? Uh, each one, touch one. Each one, teach one. Teach one, touch one. one, one. You, know, you got to touch them too. And, uh, <laughs> and be honest about it. Yes. Because yeah. I can remember at the chamber, uh, Samay, when 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 I was there and we first formed that group, and you may remember this, I brought about a, a half dozen, no, it was about 10 or 12 uh, students, college students from, from across the region. And we sat down at my conference table and I said, you know what? We are here because we want to help you uh, achieve your, 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 your dreams. And one of the young ladies raised her hand and she said, you know, I think that's wonderful, but will you be here tomorrow? Right. Right. We, we must operate in a spirit of unity and a spirit of honesty in a way that the kids know that we're here for the long haul. Yes. Well, they're tired of these short term, uh, uh, the, the short time uh, 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 people that come in their lives and then they're gone. And then they're, they're still there saying, what happened? Yes. Or, what did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. So we've got to be in it for the, for the long haul and uh and uh and be there for miles and miles and miles to go yes. because our children are looking at us and they're depending they on us to do that yes dr Dula, that um that brings us to our uh moment of quotes but before we start our uh before i share the next set of quotes with you i'd just like to ask each of the guests to please share your social media handles Oh, okay, I'll start. No, she's asking for a social media handle. I have no idea what she's talking about. <laughs> so your Facebook, your Instagram. Or oh, LinkedIn. okay. <laughs> like I tell you guys, I learned to type on old manual typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> One step beyond smoke signals. Yes. So who who do you want to start first? Um, why don't you start, Miss Parker? Okay, so um, I keep in mind, I'm again, I'm, I'm a generation behind Dr. Dula. So, you know, I like to always start with my website, okay, before I do my social social media handle. Absolutely. But um, I mentioned it earlier as um, www.roasaliv as in Victor, es.org. That's www.rosaliz.org. And then I also have a um, a project management um, website as well. And it's called um, www.themakingofyou, the letter U.com. Again, www.themakingofyou.com. But if you want to switch on over to the um, social media side, you can go to my Instagram. You can look for Sharon underscore leading underscore within or you can just find me on social um social on facebook at sharon parker i normally got a picture of myself with you know something going on giving you access to my different websites as well so yeah so sharon mm -hmm. underscore leading underscore within or just google sharon parker and a lot of my stuff come up i've been promoting stuff for years so i'm i'm, I'm one i'm up there in the top you know search parts now when you you, you google my name so I'm happy about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And Samaj, if you, are you a, is your internet uh, working now? Are you able to give us your, a social media handle? Maybe not. Looks like he's frozen. Still. Can you hear me? Or All right. Yes. All right. I'm just going to talk. If you can't hear me, uh, I'll try again. But it's uh. So I'm Samay Rashad again. Um, my book website, my publishing website is www.tinytailbooks.com and you can find the Instagram handle for that or Facebook handle for well, Facebook and Instagram at, at uh, Tiny Tail Books. And then my personal one, feel free to follow me there, um, thought leadership and things like that, uh, life um, family stuff on, um, it's at Samazing, S-E-M-A-Z-I-N-G. And I see you got on the screen. Thanks again. Thanks. And 
You're up next, James. So I have Facebook and Instagram and my website. That's what I'm going to do. So my Facebook and Instagram are both the same. It is III, uh, the number four, M-E, uh, uh, space, capital T-H-E, space, capital uh, A, and then N-T-I hyphen bullying, uh, space movement at uh, capital M. Then um, my Instagram is the same, or it's just all smooshed in through for me, the anti-bullying movement. And my website is www.iii, the number four, I mean, uh, inc.com. It's all circling around in the bottom. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. No Dr. Dula, we can find you on Facebook under the... The Socratic Speaker. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks to, thanks to uh, Tara Lewis and Crystal Glenn who gave me that title. <laughs> they, <laughs> they administer the uh, Facebook, and I don't have a clue half the time, uh, you know, how to how to put things in there. They do it all for me. So thank you. That brings us to our next quote: "If I cannot achieve independently, I can strive to achieve with unity." And as you have shared throughout this um, chat, Dr. Dula, the uh, benefits of mentoring and the importance and significance of mentoring on evolutionary elders beyond the obvious. Evolutionary elders look beyond the obvious to see the possibilities. And that concludes uh, your quotes for this evening. I have one more. You know, and every quote comes with a story, so, so please uh, <laughs> indulge me. You know, as I was teaching world history, I often taught about uh, a young man by the name of Buddha who was born with a so-called silver spoon in his mouth. Uh, but he was a very curious person. And he ventured outside his comfort zone uh, one day to find out uh, what was outside the walls of his uh, existence. And he saw many things from, from death and sickness and despair. And he's, he, he started his journey to try to become enlightened, to see the world in a different way. And, uh, and, and I wrote one quote that I'd like for you to comment on, everyone to comment on this, because it can, it, it, it is something that, we all experience, we see, but sometimes we don't understand it. And it goes like this. Enlightenment is fueled by the wise who see life for what it is and do something about it. Now read it again. Enlightenment is fueled by the wise who see life for what it is and do something about it. I was listening to each one of you, uh, especially James, as he was talking about being bullying. Wise young man. He saw life for what it was and said that I'm not going to be uh, uh, captured in this moment to where I give up. Mm. I'm going to keep hope alive and, and, and wisely I'm going to move past this. I'm sure he had to think it through and, and plan his next footsteps. But he made a wise decision because he saw in order for him to arrive at his truth, in order for him to become enlightened, enlightened, he had to rise above that bullying that, took, that was taking place in his life. And, uh, and, 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 and it worked. He is really, really on the road to success. And I'm really looking forward to keeping up with him as we go through. I was listening to Miss Parker and, and some of the things that she said. She's a wise person who has become enlightened because of uh, what she has seen in life and because of her inner feelings that said there's more that I can do to make a difference. And she's out there doing it. I look at Samay, that young man that, that uh, came into my office and said, there's more to life and I want to learn what it is. Mm. He was seeking enlightenment. How do I become uh, more knowledgeable? so that I can arrive at my own truth because truth comes from, from within. Yes. And you have to figure out 
life in order to arrive at that truth. Sometimes you have to weigh different decisions. Sometimes you have to go through conflict. But enlightenment is when that light bulb goes off and you say, I got it. Yeah. And I see that in Miss Dupree every day. I've seen it in Tara Lewis. I've seen it in, 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 uh, in many people in my life. I've seen it in Crystal Glenn. They came in at the Chamber of Commerce, just like uh, Rashad uh, did. And they walked in and said, we won't help. We're looking at doing some things with our lives. But they were two young ladies, and I guess in the early 20s. And they were trying to figure it out. But by, by, by interacting with people who helped guide their footsteps, and by growing up older and seeing the world for what it is, they gained that enlightenment. That light bulb went off. And they said, this is who I am. This is where I'm going. And uh, like Dr. King said, we got to keep on dreaming. But if we don't teach a kid to dream, if we don't teach that they're worthy, if we don't teach them that they're somebody, and to keep hope alive, they'll give up at the first stage. So enlightenment means get yours, see the world for what it is, mm -hmm. and help somebody else along the way. And I have something to ask. That's Dr. Du Bois' philosophy. I live by it every day. And that's something I truly believe in. So what, when we talk about enlightenment, how does that uh, uh, affect you, who you are? Hmm. Let me take a stab at it for me. Um, I share with everyone that I'm a civil rights baby. Five years old when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated knowing how my life was as a, as a child as my family were deprived even though we had the essentials you know like a home like a, a home and we, we we had no transportation but we had food that we could grow um we could take care of animals and you know all of that but i always felt deprived as a child um and i'm and i'm mainly um i didn't realize when i was younger but i was deprived of education i was deprived of knowledge and it was the knowledge of self. And the enlightenment for me is recognizing that, but recognizing that God was leading me down that path of knowing, trying to find out who I was. And God was putting my passion in me. And, and the only thing I had to do was work at it. If I just worked and worked and worked, he would reveal to me what you know I needed to do to try to add value. Um, I don't need for anything, you know, I don't need for anything. So I don't have to be doing this. I'm not doing it for money. I'm doing it for the next generation. So the enlightenment in me is finding out what was my root cause to make me want to go down this path and then asking God to lead me along the way so that I could discover how to make an impact. And for those who know me, it's all about the next generation. I do it. My enlightenment is the next generation. You ever heard the saying, the truth shall set you free? Mm -hmm. When you arrive at that truth and you know who you are. Yes. And, and you know the purpose of your life. Yes. You true, That's when you become free. The shackles are that. off. I feel it. Yeah. The shackles are off. Mm. I think um, just to say, as you just said, Dr. Dula, when you arrive uh, at that truth, uh, the enlightenment, enlightenment. Uh, it's inside. It's something that is yours and yours alone. Your enlightenment is very a very personal journey. And you will know uh, once you begin your enlightenment. And it, uh, there's a natural curiosity and it is uh, grows into a thirst for more. And although it is something that is very um, personal, to become enlightened, you have to broaden your sense of community, mm. uh, to share ideas, to have uh, a diverse, uh, diverse in engagements with others to um, to rationalize, to reason. I think one of the things that I uh, liked in, in terms of the history and the pictures of seeing the people gathering together, but reasoning and sharing their ideas uh, to each other, and that enlightenment now the spark that is within you, you're sharing that just like you're lighting a candle and passing that torch. So that's how that enlightenment uh, becomes, but it has to start. Uh, it's a very personal journey, uh, understanding your personal truth uh, for enlightenment to actually take place. So that's what it means to me. 
you know, Mr. Free, that really uh, made me made me think, made me go back to think. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up in Doola Baptist Church <laughs> in Doola Town, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And if you do if you Google that, you'll find out that the Doulas are a historical family. Mm -hmm. And uh, PBS has a series on the Doula family. Uh, for anyone that would like to, to Google that on PBS. But we always sang in that in our church, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying is that light is on the inside. But once you become enlightened and once you become committed to letting that light shine, others will see that radiant glow that's around you. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to go to them. They will gravitate to you. Because your light is shining. You know, at Crossland, I went in and I said, you know, I'm looking for the student with the bright eyes. Mm -hmm. And at first, teachers didn't understand what I was talking about. But after a while, they became, began to catch on. Uh, and they, they came to me and said, Dr. Dula, here's a student over here. Or he's going to be in your class or she's going to be in your class. She's got bright eyes. All it meant was this was a student that wanted to learn. And you could see it in their demeanor. And when they wanted to learn, they were in your face all the time until they got it. And so that's what I'm talking about when we talk about uh, transgenerational experience. We get it based on our environment and our experiences, and we give it to somebody else. Hmm. We don't let it die with us. Because when it dies with us, all is lost. So our job, when we cut off our computers today, we turn off the social media, we get out of Facebook, our job is to once again think, how can I move forward to help the next generation get what they need? And we're not going to solve that today, but we're going. We, I think we should keep this up until we come to some conclusions, until our enlightenment as a group uh, is evident. Absolutely. Uh, that's what the young lady said to me. You're here today, but will you be here tomorrow? Mm. That's what she was talking about. So we have to, you know, I've gone to, 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 to these uh, set on panels. Panel over here, panel over there. Set on another panel to talk about what the next panel is going to talk about. Yes. So finally, I got tired of sitting on a panel. I said to him one day, I'm not sitting on any more panels until we have a plan. There's that name again, Jan, uh, by James. Uh, until we have a plan that we can take to the community. That's right. Well, I think uh, that's our next step. Mm -hmm. That's our next step. I think we have we have uh, uh, we have opened up a, a, a new territory here, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to the next chapter. Well, the next chapter starts with Carrie Flynn. With Carrie Jim starts the next chapter. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. Oh, right. oh. <laughs> who is that? <laughs> it's I, Carib Jim, aka Tara, aka Miss Lewis, aka all of that that I've been called tonight. Um, now is the time for Dr. D. This is this is your time. We want to hear more from you. We've heard from you in the beginning. We've heard from you throughout. And now we want you to kind of close us out. Speakers, please stay on. We're going to do one last plug before we get off. But we definitely want to give um, Dr. Dula a few more minutes to talk on, um, to speak on Black History Month and what we've been talking about all night. But before we do that, I told you guys we will come back and give more of a plug, more information on Dr. D. So here we go. Uh, Dr. James Dula is a social anthropologist with vision to see and courage to act and a transgenerational educator who understands our future and is determined to measure how well we learn lessons from the past. He is the Socratic, Socratic speaker. It is the method of delivering the Ducratic agenda, which is a theory. So. With that being said, Socratic speaking encourages others to seek enlightenment through self-examination in order to arrive at the truth. Dr. Dula believes that through the study of history, social and environmental influences, we see reality before us and then must determine where we fit in based on 
personal values and the social norms within our environment. That is how we see the truth. The Ducratic Agenda is a community-based initiative driven by community stakeholders dedicated to identifying and impacting items of interest, social and political, affecting our world today. That is what the Socratic speaker speaks of. The Ducratic Agenda employs the philosophy of Dr. W.E. Du Bois, whereas we must strive for continuous improvement, realizing one can do a lot, but two can do so much more. The country today is divided racially, economically, and socially. However, the future can be brightened with interactive, intergenerational sharing and understanding. I'm going to welcome right now to the stage, Dr. James Dula, a.k.a. the Socratic Speaker. Well, thank you, Tara, once again. And I want to thank everyone that uh, presented tonight. I think it's been a lively discussion. And I want to thank everyone that uh, uh, brought this broadcast to us, Tara, Crystal, uh, Mr. Pre, uh, because this is the type of forums we need uh, now more than ever before. Because we know that uh, society is changing. We know that our role must be to prepare the next generation. We know that we are being watched in everything we do. We understand that there are those out in the community seeking enlightenment, and we must use our historical facts, and I'll say it again, historical facts, to be able to, to show them the way to achieve success in life. I often do it by talking history. I love history, and, uh, and I love talking about uh, the great kingdoms of, of Africa when we were kings and queens in our own motherland. I love talking about uh, king Mansa Musa, who was the uh, who was uh, the king of the richest uh, uh, kingdom in the world at that time, I love talking about Queen Nzinga and how she uh, protected her kingdom and 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 did not allow the Dutch or anyone else to infiltrate her kingdom and enslave her people. For fifty years, she ruled on the throne. I love to talk about the strength of our black community. I love to talk about Harriet Tubman and how she rose uh, up uh, to be a, a champion of the people. And I often talk about it was her tenacity to go back down in the slave territory time and time again to rescue uh, uh, slaves and to rescue her parents and to rescue her brother and to rescue family members and, and, and God that would pass to freedom. Uh, I often talk about having the, uh, the, the educational desire to, to learn more and to achieve more that Frederick Douglass had when he escaped slavery and rose up to be one of the best orators that the world has ever known. Self-taught, self-educated. But he had to, too, to, uh, to depend on himself and that inner spirit to guide his footsteps forward. I talk uh, a lot about uh, A. Philip Randolph and how he was important in educating people to the fact that they, if they just only came together in a spirit of unity, they could make a difference. And because of his leadership, it gave rise to a young man who gave a I Have the Dream speech standing on the uh, steps of the uh, Lincoln Memorial with words that will go down in history. I often say words that will live in infamy. Uh, I often think about the kings and the uh, and the Rosetta Parks and, uh, and the Malcolm X's and the W.B. Du Bois and the Booker T. Washington's that, that uh, had, a, had the nerve to step out to make a difference, even when it was risky, even when it was not popular. Something inside them said, I got mine. Now I have to help somebody else. And that's the theme of tonight. When we talk about transgenerational experience, we're talking about exactly about getting yours and then going out and helping somebody else. You know, if you don't do it for yourself, as we used to say, do it for your race. Because we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. And by working with people like Sharon Parker, with some uh, uh, Shamay Rasad, with, with, with Master James, with Dupree, with Lewis, with Glenn, all those of you that had a thumbprint on this program tonight, 
I know that we're going to open up new territories. We're going to contact new people. We're going to make a difference in our world. And, uh, and I'm comfortable with that. I looked at my history to say, we did it our way. Now, youth, you have to do it your way. But stand on the shoulders of those that got you here. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to get a mentor that will guide you in the right foot uh, in the right direction. Ask them, how do I do this? How do I do that? Where do we go from here? And remember what Dr. Du Bois said. Reading is fundamental. Read. Very important on the road to enlightenment. So, Miss uh, Tara Lewis, I'll leave with this thought. One can do a lot of things, but two can do much more. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Miss Lewis. I want to thank everyone that's here on the program tonight. And I'm looking forward to the next program already. Thank you. Okay, okay, so what we're going to do right now, we're going to just gonna do some last minute social media plugs. So I want to start with Master James. I love that name. I like Dr. Duda called you that. Let's start with our youngest. Okay, so I have my website at uh, www.iiiinc.com. And then I have my Facebook at... Uh, I have my Facebook at Three for Me Inc. The Anti Bowling Movement. It's, that's the same for my Instagram, and so that's all. All right. Next up, we're gonna have Miss Sharon Parker. Please give us your social media. Okay. If you could go to Sharon underscore Leading underscore Within, that's my Instagram. You can also go to my website at www themakingofyou.com. We're hosting our ninth annual Leading Within Conference in May, May 20th through the 22nd. Looking for speakers, vendors, authors, production team, like Tara and her crew. <laughs> so just <laughs> know that we're going to be seeking you. Um, but yes, Sharon, um, Sharon Parker on um, Facebook. But definitely, um, Dr. Du, I just want to officially say thank you for this platform. Thank your team for the platform. I love it. You're doing wonderful. All right. Our next speaker, Samay, are you there? Can you please plug your social media for us, sir? Samay, I think it's Samay's freezing. Samay, can you hear me? Can you plug your social? Can you hear me now? So, Samay yes. Rashad, um, you can find me at www.tinytailbooks.com. I'm also on uh, Instagram at tinytailbooks, so at tinytailbooks and at Samazing on Instagram. So, um, this was a great opportunity to just listen, learn, um, and, and lead is what I tell my children every, every day when they go to school. Listen, learn, lead, and love. And uh, I appreciate your love, Doc, Doc, and all the speakers. Uh, you are a true griot, as they call it, for all your, your teaching that you continue to do um, throughout your life. Your life. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Samay. And next up, we have Miss Montre Dupree. Tell everybody who you are, what you do. You were giving the quotes for tonight. Give us some information. Yep. <laughs> Give us some information. <laughs> you know, I was not expecting that at all, at all. Uh, I'll just say Montre Dupree, Community Outreach and Engagement uh, Volunteer with uh, the Veterans Commission with Dr. Dula. And I'm just happy to be a part of this whole uh, program uh, to share in the community. That's it. Thank you so much, Montre. You're so Appreciate welcome. it. Absolutely. So I guess there's just me. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for tuning in. I'm going to speak for myself and Miss Glenn. We are a part of Wild Radio and OG Media Productions. We put on uh, tonight's programming, but you can catch us both at Black Women Connecting Communities. We're there. You check us out. You check out um, all the women in our, connect, uh, our collective. Again, that is Black Women Connecting Communities. That's www.blkwomencc.com. You can find out more information about 
us there. And I definitely want to say also, you could just Google us at BLK Women CC. We are on all social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. If you just, again, put in BLK Women CC, you will find us. We have a podcast um, every second and fourth Wednesday of the month. We just wrapped up our unapologetically black series uh last monday through wednesday um and we had miss sharon parker on and mr pre on so please go and check out those episodes again if you just go to uh, www.blkwomencc.com and, and go to our podcast section you will find all of that there so again i want to thank everyone for joining us tonight i want to thank all of the speakers i want to um thank dr doula this was your idea um, I definitely have to say this. You wanted and you've always wanted to inform and educate everyone about black history, about um, our heritage, the royalty. And I want to thank you, sir, for bringing us all in, for taking us all under your wing, for mentoring us. You've done so much for us. And and just with you guys listening tonight, I know you, everyone, um, whether you know him, I know some of you guys know him. Some of you guys are getting to know him right now. But he is a Socratic speaker. He cares and he's here to educate. So thank you guys again for joining. Please follow Dr. D. We call him Dr. D. <laughs> but do, AKA Dr. James Dula, AKA the Socratic speaker. And he has a lot of other AKAs <laughs> as well. But please follow him at www.facebook.com slash the Socratic speaker, the Socratic speaker on Facebook. Um, if you just search the Socratic speaker, Google him too. You will find out. You can Google his name. You can Google the Socratic speaker. He will be there. So thank you guys. Thanks to our listeners, viewers, speakers, and participants. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. And You're welcome. we will do this again. Okay. Yes. It's on you, Dr. D. I'm throwing it to you. <laughs> In front of everybody, it's on you. I'm throwing it to you. We will so do it again. You know. mm -hmm. Well, just let me uh, say this uh, before we go. Uh, tonight ends Black History Month. But it begins Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. So let us remember all the black women who have made many sacrifices for us to be here and those that influence our lives along the way. So uh, all throughout the month of March, uh, we will be doing some things uh, for, uh, for uh, on, 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 the, on the Facebook website thingy that Kara, Tara uh, administers for us. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of things throughout the month to highlight uh, black women during the Women's History Month. Remember, uh, wear your red, black, and green uh, uh, during the month as we celebrate Harriet Tubman's 200th birthday. So with that being said, thank you.